Good morning, I'm Doris Tragos, and this is a day in my life as a lawyer. No change has been more dramatic than it's been over the last year with my son designing a new office and we're moving into a new office, the pandemic changing the way we practice law, and some of those dramatic changes that have happened, and I've been practicing for 40 years, you're going to see today in the way we practice today. For instance, although you may think that I'm wearing the normal coat and tie, for 40 years I never ever wore jeans to the office and I never would allow any staff to wear jeans. Now, as you can see, I wear jeans. You'll learn later why I've got jeans on down here, but a shirt and tie and a coat on up here. So as you look around the office, some of the other dramatic changes. Instead of having plaques all over the walls, because we spent a lot of money on plaques in the old days, we have a TV screen that shows our awards in the lobby on a loop. And as you walk into the office, you'll notice we don't have the heavy, overstuffed leather chairs in the lobby like we would have in an office that I designed. And if you go in here, the large conference room, you see that screen up there? Well, just this month, we used that screen where a federal judge from Salt Lake City, Utah was up there. My clients and I were down here. There was a $500 million tax fraud case uh, where they were in indicted and we had our case in Salt Lake City, but because of the pandemic, we didn't have to go there live for sentencing. They were sentenced here, we were here, our witnesses were in our small conference room testifying on Zoom, the judge was on Zoom, and fortunately for our clients, the judge decided not to send them to jail and gave them probation. But it was all done remotely and I never had to appear in court, which is sad because one of the favorite things of practicing law that I loved was I loved appearing in court. But that's a rarity now in the way things are going. I told you that uh, we don't have plaques up anymore and we spent a lot of money on plaques in the old days. So we decided to make this room the more traditional room and we put up uh, a lot of our plaques that we've had over the years that awards and uh, uh, distinguished achievement. So we put them in this conference room as well as some interesting memorabilia. Um, I represented uh, Macho Camacho and Roberto Duran. Uh, they signed that poster where they fought against each other and I was up there for that fight. On the right, if you know who Dimebag Darrell is, he was the lead guitarist for uh, Pantera and we represented Dean Guitars and Dean Guitars gifted me Dimebag Darrell's guitar. If you look real close, you can see that there is a razor blade uh, in the neck of that guitar, which was Dimebag's characteristic. Another change that happened over the 40 years, if you notice when I walked in, I didn't have a briefcase. I used to always have a briefcase. What has taken the place of the briefcase? My iPad. I've got everything in here and more than I ever had in a briefcase. It's more efficient, it's faster, and frankly, it's one of the changes I really love. Okay, I think it's time we head back to the office and get the day started. Now we're in my office. This is the one of the few offices and places in the uh, whole office that I was allowed to do what I wanted to do. And that is, I could put artwork up on the walls. Uh, I had a traditional chair rail, two-tone paint. I had a traditional conference table with traditional chairs on it. This table right here, I got in 1985. When I left the U.S. Attorney's Office, this was the first desk that I bought in my first office. And I have kept it ever since. It's been really good luck to me. Uh, and I'm sure I'll keep it until I retire. The uh, two screens. Never in a million years did I think I'd have two screens. And now some people in our office have three screens. When I first practiced law, we eventually had one secretary with one computer and she was, did all the word processing for the entire office. And then when I went to the U.S. Attorney's Office, only the secretaries had computers on their desks, not the lawyers, because there was no need, everybody thought, for lawyers to have computers. Now, if you don't have computers, if you don't have multiple screens, you're behind the times. It's important for a lawyer to adapt to the times, to understand the technology, 
and that's what I've done. And my son has made sure that I've adapted the technology. Since 1985, I've had this hutch with me. And this hutch originally came from my parents' house. And then when they sold their house, I took it and I put it in my office. Back in the corner is a, uh, the Theo Mamazellus. If you see that, that is a cutout from a trial that I had. It's known as the Road Rage trial from Tarpon Springs. And we had cutouts of all the people at the Road Rage. And we placed them at various places during the trial as to where they were located during the crime. And that resulted in a not guilty verdict. That was good. Then I'm a Seminole, so there's Bobby Bowden uh, up there. I've got my children, my grandchildren. Again, this is what I would call a traditional office. And then I have Jesus watching over me up there, saying, Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterwards receive me to glory. So that keeps me on the straight and narrow. When I first walked in this morning, I said I would explain why I've got jeans on, but up above I've got the, the dress shirt, the tie, the coat. The reason I've done that is because I have a hearing this morning. And that hearing is a Zoom hearing. So I can sit at my desk, I look into my iPad, and I talk to the judge. He sees me, but all he sees is from the desk up. So I'm not wearing dress pants. But what he sees is I have dressed appropriately for court. There was a time when we started doing these Zoom hearings where lawyers were appearing in bathing suits at their swimming pool. And eventually the court had actually issued an order saying that lawyers had to dress appropriately for court, even on the Zoom hearings. So that's the reason I wear a coat and tie, although I never appeared at a swimming pool in a bathing suit, ever. Uh, but some lawyers apparently did. So we always wear a coat and tie, at least I always do when I appear in court. This is a pretrial hearing. The reason we cannot record when I start the sound on the hearing is because only the court reporter is allowed to take down what happens in court. No one is allowed to make a recording in a court proceeding without a separate court order, which the courts never give. So there can only be one record of what happens in that hearing. So the court controls the Zoom. They send out the Zoom invitation you go online, they put you in a waiting room normally, and then when it's your turn, your case comes up, they take you out of the waiting room and they put you up live and you say your piece. Although this does save a lot of time because think about it, I don't have to get in my car, I don't have to drive to the courthouse, I don't have to get in the parking lot, find a space, go through the metal detectors, go up to the third or fourth floor, find my courtroom, and then sit in that courtroom with maybe 30 other lawyers who have hearings set at the same time. Although I came in today at 10 o'clock, which is the normal time I would come in, give or take a little bit, unless I have a hearing. A lot of hearings start at 8.30 in the morning, and therefore I'd have to come in early uh, in order to do that. But 8.30 is a time when you'd have 50 lawyers in that courtroom. So you might sit there all morning until your case gets called. Now, it's time efficient, at least, for you to come in here, I can do other work while I'm in the waiting room, and then the court can pull me in when it's time for my case to come up. So I, I see now the, the judge is about to pull me up, so you won't hear what's going on anymore, but you may see it. All right, thank you, Your Honor. That's all that we have. Thank you. Well, that's the way things have been going now. And to show you again how things have changed, the hearing's over. I've taken notes of the hearing. These notes, instead of just putting in a file, will be scanned. We're going paperless. It will be put in an electronic file so that everything that's in a case, including the lawyer's notes, will be electronic. What that does, like the rest of the world now, is we can be remote. We can go anywhere. I can take my iPad, I can be on a bus, I can be in a cab, I can be at home, and I can remote into my office, and the entire case file is sitting electronic and digital, and I'll be able to use it. So that's one of the many ways things have changed in the practice of law. If this was an hourly case and I was billing someone by the hour, 
instead of writing it down like I used to, now I go to a digital format, I go to a program, in our case we use QuickBooks, and I plug in the hours and the time and the client, it automatically then goes to the client's file so that at the end of the month when the client is billed, this pulls it off of QuickBooks. The other thing that's changing is, are we going to keep this Zoom and remote technology? That's another issue that's uh, confronting lawyers and law firms uh, and the rules committees of the Supreme Court, is how to write rules. Because a lot of people really like the fact that they don't have to get in their car and spend hours driving down to a courthouse and waiting in a courtroom for hours until their case is called. They like sitting here, when their case comes up, they punch in because they can be doing other things. They take care of their hearing and then they can punch out of the Zoom hearing. And that saves a lot of time and a lot of money for clients. And therefore, we try to find rules now that will uh, carry this on beyond the pandemic. Because now we're looking to the future. We don't know where that future is going to be, but we've got to prepare for it. During the course of the day, uh, regularly I'll do research, I'll check my emails, which I have hundreds of every day. I will, oh, and, and I will get calls. Hello? Okay, all right, hold on a minute. Gotta cut this now. Sorry, you can't hear the call. <laughs> okay, all right, well, I'll talk to you later then. Bye. Okay, that was a call from a client. He had some questions, wanted to know something about his case. Uh, I usually, if the call is significant or something really important happens, I will make an entry and I do it on a yellow pad. Um, my guess is my partners don't do it on a yellow pad, but that's the way I do it. But another change that's really been dramatic is the effort to go paperless. So I might make my notation on the yellow pad. I put it in my box, it goes out to the staff, the staff will then scan it so that we have an electronic copy and an electronic file. And I'll tell you in a minute why that's really important and another big change over the 40 years I practiced law. The other thing I will do is we have everything digital on here and if it's an hourly case where we're billing the client by the hour, I will then go into the computer, into QuickBooks, make an entry for how long that call lasted, and it will automatically be billed based on my hourly rate to the client's account for billing at the end of the month. Again, all electronic, all paperless. It used to be we had a piece of paper where we hand wrote the time we spent on a case, and that handwritten paper would go to uh, the bookkeeper and the bookkeeper would make an entry on a bill. That doesn't happen anymore. And so we've, again, trying to do our best to go paperless. The reason that's so important, and even when we get paper, we try to scan the important documents in the electronic file, is we now have the ability to be remote anywhere like all, almost all other businesses in the country. My iPad sitting over there, I can be anywhere in the world on that iPad and remote in to see all the documents on all the cases I want. I'm home, I can sit at home, I can be in North Carolina, I can be anywhere I can remote into my office now. Because we're almost totally paperless, see the entire file, I can make a call on a case. If I need to see a document, wherever I am in the world, I can pull that document up. So that's a, a big change in how this firm is operating because again, we are trying to go paperless, which is very difficult for law firms because a lot of the courtrooms don't have Wi-Fi in the courtrooms, believe it or not. And even some of the state attorney's office, state prosecutor's office in Pinellas County, still does not use email for all their assistant state attorneys. Only select assistant state attorneys have email. So you have to actually pick up the phone or mail them something with a stamp in order for them to get it. Got the decaf, where's the decaf? Well, hello again. It's time for my afternoon coffee. We have a new machine, so this is going to be fun. So while that's brewing, what we have experienced today, what you've experienced today, 
is a lawyer that's been practicing for 40 something years and all the changes that I've had to adapt to and how we've all had to adapt to the new life. Not only a life uh, of digital, but a life of remote, uh, a life of modernization, technical, and the pandemic. So hopefully you've uh, enjoyed this. Uh, I'm going to be uh, going and doing some research. Is that too loud? Okay. The rest of the day, really, I'm reading depositions. And I read depositions different than I used to. It used to be I had the paper depo, and I would highlight it with a highlighter. Now I have a program. It's like it's digital. I put my finger across it. It highlights where my finger is. If I want to make a note, I touch a little button. It opens it up, and I can type in a little note in that deposition. So I have all my depositions sitting in that iPad, all of them highlighted. And then when my highlights and notes are done, I press a button and it gives me a report of just the highlights and just my notes. Totally different than the way we used to have to carry pounds and pounds of depositions around just to see the highlights. Why don't we go see what everybody else is doing? There's Peter, he's using the stand-up desk, which uh, I don't use much, but he seems to use a lot. But we got you one. But we got me one because we go everything three ways. So if he got one, I had to get one. Peter Sardis had to get one. <laughs> so how's it going? Great, going great. Uh, have a busy day? Trying to work. You signed two new cases today, even was it during lunch, right? Yeah. Wow, oh, busy day. Good for you. Let's go see what Peter's doing. Hello. So what are you doing? Well, I'm preparing for our expert depositions for our trial that is now scheduled for two weeks from now. Oh, I have the hearing. Did you have a hearing today? Yeah. How'd it go? Had a hearing today. It went well. Um, we're on a trial dock with about six other cases. A couple of them settled, so we are technically in the second backup. What about the issue of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the expert from Tallahassee? We just took a video deposition of the expert in Tallahassee. And so they haven't done anything on it yet? Nope, not at all. They filed a motion in limine during the time that we were actually taking the deposition. I just haven't had a chance to respond to it yet. A motion in limine is when you're trying to get the judge to rule on whether evidence is going to come in at the trial, but you want the judge to rule before the trial so that you can anticipate whether it's going to come in or not going to come in and you can prepare for it. So that's what a motion in limine does. All right, we'll see you later. This is a um, intern meeting. Uh, interns are assigned various tasks uh, to do to try to help us with our cases. And we periodically have meetings in order to have them update us on, on where they are, how far they've gone, and whether the task has been completed or not. One big advantage to working here is the fact that we actually let interns work on cases. They actually know the cases they're working on. They know what's going on. Plus, they get to be on video and they get to learn about social media and how we use social media, which again, huge difference in the way I practice law is how important social media has become. Never in my life would I think we would be doing a video of my life uh, one day as a lawyer. So if you can listen in on the cases. Just so don't mention the client names. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, first, Maddie, let me talk about you. What were you assigned to do? I was assigned to basically make a spreadsheet of um, different incidents that happened at a particular location. Okay. And so that spreadsheet came off of, you got a, I gave you a 75, well, it started out at 75 pages, although I amended it, 75 page index that we got from the police department. What we did is we have a case of a shooting at a particular location. And we did a public records request. Florida allows you to request from law enforcement any public record, any record they have. And so we have requested, with again, certain exceptions, but we have requested all the incidents, all the times the police went to this address. They sent us back 75 pages of items which show this address and police contact with this address. In looking at the 75 pages, if we would have ordered all of those reports, it'd be thousands and thousands of pages. And we don't need all the reports because some of them were just referrals to another agency or had nothing to do with any kind of violence or assault. 
So I had to have someone look through those 75 pages. I identified, uh, when I looked through the first couple, certain uh, designations that I thought were relevant, like again, assault or domestic battery or domestic assault. And then I sent those designations to Maddie, asked her to go through, and then that 75 pages covered five years, since it was so extensive, I think a limited, what, two years? Three? How many years I asked you to do? Um, you did it up until 2018, but I went ahead and did the whole thing. You did the whole thing? <laughs> Good for you. See, now that's a clerk with initiative. Okay, so you did the whole thing. Um, and so what did you find? I found that there were a lot of disturbances, a lot of assault and battery at that location. Um, quite a few more stabbings than I would have imagined. Well, since there was a shooting, our location, <laughs> stabbing is kind of a step down maybe, you know, so. Um, so, and you, I noticed when you did it here, you uh, differentiated by crime, right, based on what I, the criteria I gave you. Um, and you also, did you do one that had the entire, every, every report that had something we cared about? Did you do a cumulative list as well? Well, in other words, if I sent this back to the police and say, these are the reports I want, is there one list that will tell them all the reports that I want? I could do a sum on Excel and include everything okay. on, a, on the last page if you would like. How many reports do you think you identified? Hundreds. Hundreds of them? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we may, again, we may have to, because again, there's just no reason, if it's that extensive, we try to prove that this is a high crime neighborhood and that the address, the business at that address, should have known, or I'm sure did know, that they had a dangerous situation and therefore they should have taken precautions to make that a safer place. And if they didn't take precautions, then they would have known that this was bound to happen and therefore they are liable and negligent for not protecting those people that were lawfully on that property. So that's the reason that um, we had the law clerk go through this, had Maddie go through it and did an excellent job. Really nice detailed job. Uh, so she also right now uh, has to actually stop working on this, although you completed the task, which I'm glad, because uh, the other guys are preparing for a trial. And so uh, Maddie is actually in the middle of helping them prepare for the trial and getting their exhibits together. So we'll excuse her uh, to go back and work on that. And then what we'll do, Maddie, we'll get together on this and we'll present, uh, try to decide what kind of a request we'll make to law enforcement for those copies. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. All right, let's do it. Okay. All right, so what was your task? Uh, I'm running a complaint um, for a high-speed chase that ended in um, a death of a third party and then two injuries to two other third parties. Okay, and this is the, the, the what we're looking at. Initially, before we even drafted the complaint, I had Tyler do some research, and that research revolved around whether or not law enforcement, the police, involved in that high-speed chase had any liability for the fact that eventually that chase ended in a death. And so uh, Tyler did that first, and we talked about his research, and we talked about the case law. And then what I had Tyler go back and do is that based on that research, how would we have to, or what allegations would have to be in a complaint? What would we have to say in order to make the police liable? What would the police have to have done to be liable? Because obviously every police chase that ends in a death, the police aren't always liable. But in certain circumstances, the law says that if they do certain things, or they violate certain things, or don't follow certain procedures, at that point, they would have some liability. So what did you find? Um, so general gist of it, um, when in a high-speed chase, police act um, in a manner that's reckless. Um, they pursue a chase that they don't believe occurred from a violent felony. And when they um, violated like company policy in doing the high-speed chase, they waive their sovereign immunity, so therefore they can be sued. Um, so we're going to raise one on, on wrongful death for the one that uh, ended up dying and then two like, negligent injuries for 
um, the other two that were just simply injured. You know, one of the things I neglected to do, I didn't ask Mary Blasky, because I know you go to school with her, right? Yeah. Where do you go to law school? Uh, we, go to, we both go to school at Stetson University College of Law. Uh, and what year are you both in? Yeah, we're both 2Ls right now. What's a 2L? Uh, second year law student. Uh, uh, and, and how long is law school? Three years. Scout this year and then one more down and then we're, we're good to go. <laughs> okay. And uh, now, actually, uh, Maddie's an intern. We've actually hired you as a clerk. Yes. Right? Okay. And there's a, a kind of a different, not much of a difference, frankly. Uh, <laughs> But uh, he started as a, an intern, and then we kept him on as a clerk. Interns normally are for a set limited period of time. Uh, and they do that in order to get some practical experience. And then if they stay longer, they turn into clerks. And so, all right, so you've drafted a complaint. Now, is this the one that I gave you back with the edits, or is this uh, one already edited? This is not fully edited, but it's the one that you... I've written down. Okay, so are my notes in this one? or Your notes are not on either of them. Where's the one with my notes? Do you want to go get it? Yeah, go All get right, the right, one right. with my notes. <laughs> <laughs> All okay. Uh, okay. All right, so you have... What I normally do is take documents, I'll write on the documents, make corrections, and then they stick in my corrections. Uh, so you have started but didn't finish doing this. Right, yeah. yeah. Okay. I've made an official overview docket yet all right. for all the research that we do. One of the things I, I like you to do, um, and I know I haven't told you this before, so, is when you make the correction, take a yellow highlighter and highlight it so I can look at the this version, oh, see, know that you did through. actually make it. Because sometimes, you, if, you're not, if it didn't highlight, I know you didn't make it, yeah. so make it highlight. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so what I want you to do is take all these corrections, put them back in here, and then we will... Um, go through it again. One of the things when you're suing law enforcement, it's usually a city, because they have sovereign immunity, you've got to give them six months notice before you actually can sue them. And we've done the notice, so we have to wait until the six months is up before we can actually file this suit. Okay, so, and that's my partner's walking by. All right. Um, is there anything about the, the corrections I made that you want to ask about? Do you understand all of them? Or? Yeah, yeah, I get all of them. Okay. Okay. Sweet. That's good. Perfect. All right. That's it. And let me give you these back. Okay. Thank you very much. So that's what usually happens. We, we assign specific tasks. And sometimes in the middle of the task, we'll sit down. Sometimes we'll wait till the task is over. With Maddie, I wanted to wait till it was over. There was no need for an in, uh, interim type meeting with her. Tyler's task was, was drafting, and I was make corrections constantly. That's like the maybe the third or fourth draft of that complaint. Because number one, he's learning. The idea is for them to learn. The idea is for us to teach. Uh, and that's why they're here. Well, it's about time for me to get home. I'm the last one in, but I'm also the last one out. Everybody's already gone home, and I'll be locking up. So if you have any comments or you have any questions for us, please make sure to send them, and we'd be happy to answer them or respond. So thank you for spending the day with me. You know, uh, let that's me go. Life. That's literally what happens a day in your life, is we interrupt. We're always around, we're always yelling and clapping, and that's a day in the life. Hey, we're taking down the fourth wall, right? Taking down the curtain so they can see how the wizard lives. <laughs>